Major funding for this program is provided by the Annenberg CPV Project and the Ford Foundation. Additional funding by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. The Japanese firmly believe that might is right. The essential amorality of the Japanese is in direct conflict with Western moral imperatives. Japan is preparing an economic sneak attack from which the United States may not recover. Our nation and its underlying values are threatened. Economic dominance is their goal. These warnings are from a recent CIA-sponsored report that did little more than substitute the yellow menace for yesterday's red menace. With the dismantling of the Soviet Empire, the bipolar military imperatives of the Cold War are giving way to global economic challenges. Japan is a tough competitor, but it is also a vital economic partner, from Hollywood through Detroit to Wall Street. And beyond Japan, all of Asia is on the move. America faces a historic challenge. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Asian cultures really were shattered, really were jolted by the arrival of Europeans and Americans with technology and money and military force. And their world was changed forever by the arrival of this Atlantic culture, if you will. One can argue, and I would argue, that America and Europe are about to be jolted in the same way. That a, an economic culture that can do things that we can't do seems to have been emerging in Japan and in some of the surrounding countries. And to that extent, you can call it a Pacific century. And it's something new has been created that we have to deal with. East Asia is marching forward under a new kind of capitalism, government-guided, centrally planned, and sometimes authoritarian. In 10 years, the region from Korea south to Indonesia will be using more steel than the United States and the European community combined. The whole area is growing at twice the rate of the West. That there is an Asian challenge, that there is a, a new uh, emerging uh, East Asia out there, I think there is a consensus on that. Uh, the first response is to see that uh, East Asia as an opportunity for the United States. In order for America to continue uh, prospering, uh, you have to deal with Asia and work together with Asia. The other response is to see East Asia, the challenge of East Asia, as, as a threat. It's said that by the end of this century, Japan will have a stranglehold on the technology for automobiles, semiconductors, fiber optics, steel, and half the new patents in the world. This commercial plays on fear. The so-called Asian miracle unfolds as the United States is losing the economic leadership it once took for granted. Look what's happened to the American economy. The average American worker is making about 50 cents less in 1991 in real dollars than he was in 1970. One out of three jobs in the basic American industries have disappeared. Whole communities of people have been destroyed. There are about 40 million people living below the poverty line in the United States of America. At this point in our history, that's not a very proud boast. The life expectancy of children in the ghetto in Harlem in New York is lower than that of children in Bangladesh. Whose fault is that? We can't blame that one on the Japanese. Once the American automobile was king of the road and it drove the nation's powerful economy. The industry was created here and it dominated the world. 
In those days, Detroit was the champion. But over the years, it left itself open to the Japanese challenge. The story I tell in uh, The Reckoning about Gene Borden, a rather talented uh, Ford engineer, and he's sort of worried about the quality of the Ford cars. And he's at a dinner party, and he runs into Lyndon Townsend, one of the many saviors of uh, Chrysler, one of the many men who took over Chrysler was going to save it. And he mentions, says, Lynn, I am really worried about the quality of our cars. And Townsend says, gee, what are you worrying about quality for? Nobody worries about quality. Nobody cares about quality. The only thing people care about is their stock splits. And what's very important, because what he really means is our customers are not the people buying the cars. Our customers are the people buying the stock. By the 1970s, Detroit was stalled. The steel and rubber industries followed auto into decline. The big three shut down dozens of their plants and moved a few into low-wage third world countries. The Midwest became the Rust Belt. The core of the nation's manufacturing foundation was hollowed, and the human toll was in the millions. I mean, when I came here 19 years ago, I'm serious. You could, you could, there used to be an old saying, you know, that my friends used to say, well, if I don't like this job, I'll just quit here. I can go across the street tomorrow and get another job. And that was the truth. You could do that. I mean, this, they just wanted people. They needed people. You know, you could, you know, this company here, was glad to get you. You know, if you was going to be a decent worker, they was glad to get you. And the last 10 years, they've had the attitude, they, they wish they could get rid of you. This railroad towerman is about to lose his $25,000 a year job because of the regional freight decline. The downshift in auto production alone cost half a million jobs in Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. I'm assured to end up working uh, for half or less money, half or less than I make now. And uh, you could very well end up working anywhere. You got a family to feed, you got to feed them. My daughter's 10. There's a lot of things she wanted to do that uh, we never got to do. You know, when she's 15, 16 years old, she'll want a car and, and, I'm, and I'm facing the future of minimum wage. It's a bad situation. Anyway, you want to uh, have for your kid a future <laughs> To the Japanese, Ronald Reagan's version of free market economics would seem some form of insanity. The Japanese have never really trusted the American economists who ask us to place all our faith in Adam Smith's invisible hand. They want that visible hand evident. They want the government to help. They want the government to assist. They want the country to stand behind the society. The Japanese feel that everybody ought to get some share in the action. The Japanese miracle unfolded as industrial America declined. Soon the nation's governors were traveling to Tokyo for investment. Ours is a simple message. Kentucky is open for business. In 1982, Honda set up the first Japanese car plant in Ohio. Now there are 11 transplants here, several in joint ventures with General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Japanese capital has also revived the steel and rubber industries. Some credit the Japanese with rebuilding the Rust Belt. Others see a threat. You got a question whether you're inviting the devil in. I mean, that, uh, now I'm not saying you are, but you've got to question what you're doing when you're asking them to come in. And I've been asked by governors of a couple of states that they say, you know, do you think we should be having the Japanese in? I said, let me tell you, I said, it, that watch out uh, for that pat on the back and, uh, and all, and, and that they may have their hands around your throat before it's over with. Japan was equally suspicious of the controversial Texas financier, known for his own ruthless corporate takeovers. He bought into a Toyota subsidiary and tried to get on its board of directors. 
It was freewheeling cowboy capitalism up against corporate Japan.